there, I'm a biologist and I teach science on the internet. Yesterday, I posted a video about getting my COVID booster shot. And since then, I've been tagged in a bunch of different videos of people who are quoting VAERS data to try to dissuade others from getting the COVID vaccine. I thought we were past all this. Apparently, we are not. So to help you out, next time somebody brings up VAERS data around you, I want to read you something. This is the actual VAERS website. And right here at the top is a great big disclaimer that you have to sign saying that you read and understood this before you're allowed to access these data. And this disclaimer explains pretty succinctly why you should never do what these people are doing. Let's read a little bit of it together, shall we? VAERS accepts reports of adverse events and reactions that occur following vaccination. Healthcare providers, vaccine manufacturers, and the public can submit reports to the system. While very important in monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. In large part, reports to VAERS are voluntary, which means they are subject to biases. Vaccine providers are encouraged to report any clinically significant health problem following vaccination to VAERS, whether or not they believe the vaccine was the cause. This creates specific limitations on how the data can be used scientifically. Data from VAERS reports should always be interpreted with these limitations in mind. So to summarize, literally anybody can submit literally anything to this system. There are reports of pets dying on this system. There are reports of sunburns on this system. There are reports of cancer going into remission and people stopping smoking on this system. There are reports of itchy buttholes on this system. If you get a vaccine and go out and get hit by a bus, you could report that. It does not mean that vaccines lead to bus attacks. These data are super important for scientists to track patterns. But for everybody else, they are raw data, which means they are completely meaningless without proper context and interpretation. So if anybody is trying to quote VAERS data to you to try to dissuade you from getting a vaccine, that person is either an idiot, a liar, or both. And the charlatans on the internet who are doing just that at this moment are getting people killed. 97% of people hospitalized with COVID and 99% of people dying from COVID are unvaccinated. So please don't fall into this trap. Protect yourself and those around you and please go get vaccinated. That is called a blue-tongued skink and they are so weird. They're long like a snake. They have short, stumpy little legs like an amphibian. They give live birth like a mammal. They don't even lay eggs. How awesome is that? Not a lot of reptiles do that. They also eat anything that you put in front of them. Eggs, baby mice, rotten meat, fruit, fish, hamburger and french fries. They're omnivorous scavengers. They'll eat anything at all. They like to bury themselves under loose soil, and it's so cute to watch the way that they just tuck themselves in. The scales all over their back are super hard, but also very smooth, so they feel like a walking ear of corn. It's, it's the wildest thing I've ever felt. But the coolest thing about them, by far, is that big, beautiful blue tongue, which they use to trick potential predators like you into thinking that they're scarier than they actually are. They're harmless, they're sweet, but they want you to think that they're some horrible, poisonous monster. And that is called Batesian mimicry. You see, when an animal has bright coloration to signify the fact that it's toxic, something like a poison dart frog or a monarch butterfly, that's what we call aposematism. But Batesian mimicry, like the blue-tongued skink uses, is when a non-aposmatic species uses bright coloration to trick predators into thinking that they're an aposmatic species and that they're actually poisonous. Now, of course, predators don't know all this biological terminology. They just see bright blue and go, oh crap, and run away. And so this skink, which is just the weirdest sweetest, most harmless animal in the world gets to scare away great big predators just by going blah and making them run away. And I love them so much. Okay, real talk. This is real me. This is behind the curtain here, okay? I am absolutely thrilled that anybody asked me about this because I never get to talk about this. But like a dozen of you have asked me about this and that 
Oh my gosh, that makes my day. So I have tried to record this response video, I'm not even joking, over a hundred times. And I keep getting too excited and freaking out and ruining the video. So I'm going to do it just as best as I can here, okay? Real slow. We're going to go through it. Yes, monarch butterflies are poisonous. And the reason why they are poisonous is freaking rad. It's because they lay their eggs on milkweed plants. So that the caterpillars that hatch out of those eggs eat the milkweeds. Milkweeds are very poisonous because they contain chemicals called cardiac glycosides. And cardiac glycosides work by attacking the heart and making it pump way too hard and way too fast. So this is built-in pesticide for the milkweed. Any bugs that try to eat it are going to die of these horrible heart problems. But fun bonus fact, that's also why caffeine exists. Caffeine is to kill bugs that eat it. It's, it's pesticide. And we humans just like the effects of caffeine, and so we grow it on purpose. And we drink the pesticide in our, in our coffee and our sodas and stuff. And we do the same thing with the cardiac glycosides. Milkweed and foxglove is another plant that has these a lot of people are more familiar with. And we grow them on purpose and use that because we can use it to make, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals that treat things like congestive heart failure and, uh, atrial fibrillation and all sorts of cardiac arrhythmias. Cause when your heart beat too hard too fast, that can be really dangerous. Dangerous, but sometimes you want that. How cool is that? So the caterpillars are unique in the animal kingdom that they can eat these cardiac glycosides. They can eat these milky plants without dying in a really horrible way. And so they have no competition and they just get to munch, munch, munch on this all day long. They're super specialized. And so they eat these milkweed plants and they retain the glycosides in their body as they metamorphize into a butterfly. And that's why monarchs are so brightly colored. It's a posematism. They're showing, hey, if you eat me, I'm just chalked to the brim with chemicals that'll make your heart explode. And sure enough, when a bird eats a monarch butterfly, it gets really sick and it throws up. It usually doesn't die. It just pukes a whole bunch. And so birds have learned not to do that. And that is why viceroy butterflies look almost identical to monarchs. It's Batesian mimicry, just like with the skink. They look like they're poisonous, even though they're not. And that's why we call them viceroys and not monarchs. They're not the top. They're not the you know, the king. They're just the viceroy. They're the because naming things is beautiful and fun sometimes, and nature is fucking awesome. Here we have a length of chain. Let's cover up a couple of links right here. Oh no, our chain. It's broken. Now you tell me which is more reasonable. Is it more reasonable to say? I don't have any data here, but this is very clearly a complete chain, and this is very clearly a complete chain, so this whole thing is probably just one big complete chain, or at the very least, two complete chains. Or is it more reasonable to say, I don't have any data right here, so there's no good reason to believe that this chain exists. This makes no sense. This makes no sense. To call this a chain would be a complete leap of faith, and the only possible explanation for these metal pieces up here is magic. That is amazing. That's called a barrel eye fish. And you might think that its eyes are those dark spots in the front of its face. No, those are its nose. Its eyes are the big glowing green orbs that are angled straight up. That's why the top of its head is clear, because its eyes are at a 90 degree angle pointing straight up, and it hovers almost perfectly still in the water, looking up until it sees what it wants to eat. What does it want to eat? It steals prey from siphonophores, which are like jellyfish, they're these big long dangly creatures, so it just hangs out there until it sees a siphonophore dangling by, and then it shoots up with its freaky eyes rotating to the front of its face to be in line with its mouth, and snatches the prey away from the siphonophore, and that big clear dome protects its face from being stung by the tentacles. They are radically cool creatures, dude. Barrel eye fish. Also known as spook fish. So many people were thrown off by this. I feel like I should make a follow-up video. You're right. Fish do have gills, and that's how they breathe. But when I said that the fish has a nose, I wasn't talking about breathing. I was talking about smelling. Because smells do exist underwater. Remember, smells are made of molecules that physically interact with nerves to send a signal to your brain. So it's not like there's some magical, ethereal thing. You don't have any kind of telepathic sense that there's a platter of cookies nearby. When you smell those cookies, that is a physical object that is physically interacting with your body. So I would have said that these are the fish's olfactory organs, but that wouldn't have made a lot of sense to a lot of people. So I just said, this is the fish's nose to make it more digestible. I hope this clears this up, and if you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments.
boom, and I'm a worm. Look at me go. Oh, I'm like a fish thing now. That's pretty cool. Oh, I'm like a tetrapod, some sort of lizard creature. That's awesome. Oh, we're going straight into monkey. That's skipping several steps, and I'm a human now. What? of color have lighter colored skin on the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet. Hello, I'm an evolutionary biologist and a bioanthropologist. I study all this stuff for fun. That's a great question. Why do people of color tend to have lighter skin on the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet? And the answer is actually really quite simple. This skin is super thick. That's it. The whole reason why we have melanin in our skin in the first place is to protect us from the harmful rays of the sun, both from sunburns and from photodegradation, destroying really important chemicals like folate. That's not an issue when your skin is so thick that it blocks out the sunlight all by itself. The skin on the soles of your feet, that is the thickest skin on your whole body. Plus, you're walking on those all day anyway. Why do you need to have sunscreen there? So that's it. This sounds like a really complicated question, but it has a really simple answer. This skin is super thick. There is no reason to put melanin there, so there's no evolutionary pressure for that to happen. Have an awesome day. Thank you so much for asking. Let's talk about this comment for a second. This was left in my video about why boys can wear nail polish. And this person, I really do believe, is coming from a good place. They don't want to see kids getting bullied. And they think that the best way to avoid that situation is for those kids to adhere to social norms. And they don't think that something as seemingly trivial as painting your fingernails is worth the price of being ostracized. That's all totally understandable. But I have two major problems with this line of thinking. The first is that every single bit of art and music and fashion and social justice and revolution, every good thing about human society comes from people who disregard social norms. These rules function the best when they're being broken. And teaching kids that it's okay to do something like paint your nails if you want to is a great way to reinforce the beautifully subversive idea that if something makes you happy, and it doesn't hurt anybody else, you should do it. And secondly, we could be talking about the underlying causes of bullying, the things that make bullies, food insecurity, overmedication, undermedication, abuse, neglect, poor education. If we were addressing those issues, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. But worse than ignoring all of that is teaching kids to abuse themselves by covering up who they really are, just to avoid being abused by somebody else. Because as somebody who's been through both of those things, I can tell you that the first one's a lot worse. If we want to stop bullying, we need to teach kids how not to be bullies, not teach them how to avoid being bullied.